Retrocaris have been described as having fission fusion grouping patterns since the 1980s when Marcii was first found that they split into groups and foraged up to two kilometers apart. Within the new framework for fission fusion dynamics this equates to variation in party size and IRAs measured the frequency of observation of different feeding group size categories uh, without actually defining the group size um, but also the party size on a per tree basis. Since then we've made just a few advances uh, with the species uh, working on the Peruvian red wakari subspecies, Kakajau calvasuchiali, which are the ones in the pictures. But there are a number of practical difficulties in measuring the different uh, variables in fission fusion dynamics in the field for these species. And these problems will be common to related species uh, of Pithocene monkey and also to several species which share certain key characteristics with wakaris. And this is the focus of the talk. Rokaris are pithocines which, apart from being famously difficult to observe, are basal to the other New World primates and therefore interesting to look at when we're looking at the evolution of um, fish and fusion dynamics. The pithocines consist of the titi monkeys which live in type family groups, the saki monkeys which live in uh, family groups but have been observed in larger groups and there's just a hint there that, that family groups might come together at times. And uh, the closely related bearded sarkis have similar grouping patterns to, to rokaris um, in which fission fusion has been observed in, in many populations but there are also many populations which don't show um, high variability in, in group sizes too. Rokaris live in famously large group sizes. Uh, at our study site uh, groups of, of 80 plus are, are very common and we frequently see groups of, of up to 160, actually that's a minimum count. And we know those groups can spread over quite a large area and sometimes can split into two or more and forage several kilometers apart. So if we look at the framework, we might predict that spatial cohesion and uh, party size might vary a lot, but we have no idea if group composition is consistent. So we don't really know if wakaris will fit into group C uh, along with the spider monkeys and chimpanzees or will be more like the primates that fit into to group B here uh, like some of the baboons. So how do we go about measuring fish and fusion dynamics in these species so that we compare uh, different populations or different species or the same groups in different conditions such as different seasons or different habitats? Well we've had a go at a study site in uh, northeastern Peru, uh, Lago Preto and at Lago Preto we have three main habitats. We have the, the terra firma forest which never floods. We have seasonally flooding forests which are flooded for half the year. And we have permanently waterlogged palm swamp forests. So what are these practical difficulties that we've been talking about? Well this isn't the result of any modelling unfortunately. This is an approximated visualisation based on ad lib observations and nearest neighbour distan distances. So in a group of 40 like this one, we can measure the diameter of the group by walking beneath with a GPS. And we can work through the group and get a good proportion of the inter-individual distances for most members of the group. But once we get groups of 80 or more, uh, getting the inter-individual differences becomes practically impossible. Although if they're still tightly packed together, we can still measure the diameter of the group. However, uh, groups of 80 or more uh, are often spread over a much larger area um, and to a human observer this seems to be uh, can seem to be quite a continuous group and a rough estimate uh, some of these groups can be spread over an area of about a kilometer in diameter so measuring the spread of the group uh, and even into individual distances becomes extremely difficult um, just to show you what that looks like from the ground um, what we're getting are, are glimpses of uh, a few individuals at, at a time, usually the canopy is pretty dense um, and the individuals can be quite hard to pick up. Fortunately you do hear them, they're very vocal and um, groups of wakaris are not silent for very long so you can get an idea of, of how many are where and at least um, find out where they are so you can go and count each individual little party within the the big group. 
I'm also going to eliminate the possibility of measuring variation in group composition. Although we do have some males that are quite easily recognised from their scars, we couldn't do this frequently enough or reliably enough to, to use the data. So that leaves us with variation in party size. And that has the typical difficulty of um, defining party size. How, how far apart do they have to be before you consider them a separate party? We originally based our cutoff distance at the maximum distance that we could detect the Wakari's loudest uh, bark call. But that quite rightly received some criticism because uh, Wakari detection of that call is unlikely to be similar or the same as humans standing on the forest floor. But we measured the detection distance at around 150 metres. So we accept that Wakari's might be able to hear each other at distances greater than 150 metres. Uh, but the important thing is that the different parties should be out of range for feeding competition. And first of all, the bark calls didn't appear to be associated with food calls. And that's since been backed up by studies on uh, related species uh, like the ones uh, Bruno Bezzera has done for black wakaris. One call that did appear to be associated with food, uh, at least some of the time, was the hick call uh, following Fontaine or the kakaka call following uh, Marcia Iris, and human detection for that call was less than 100 metres. Now we have the same problem of course that Wakaris might be able to hear that much further away, but the important thing is they need to hear it and be able to react to that call and travel to the food source. Now rapidly moving groups of Wakaris uh, cover about 100 metres uh, in 10 minutes when they're feeding, when they're foraging rapidly through a piece of forest, and, and, that, and that matches up with uh, primates of similar body sizes moving through forest uh, in other studies. And given the typical length of a feeding bout for red wakaris, it's fairly unlikely that in most circumstances the wakaris are going to react to those food calls and get to the, the source in time. So we considered them, uh, for the purposes of feeding composition, separate. Now that might seem fairly arbitrary still, but we think the principle is good that separation distances could be based on the distance at which parties will hear and react to food calls. For these species where it's difficult to measure into individual distances and use a modelling approach. Incidentally this highlights the importance of doing communication studies uh, like the ones uh, Bruno Bezzera has done for black wakaris. So having set and partially justified our cutoff distance of 150 metres, um, what we did was uh, count the parties every 10 minutes but because detection was kind of difficult in, in the forest, what we'd do is take the largest count um, for an hour period, which would give us what we felt was quite a, a decent uh, estimate of the maximum group size for each hour. And that's actually a fairly standard way of doing things following Chapman et al, 1993. Now with that information, we can look at a few things. Like Marcio Iris, we can look at the frequency of observation of different party size categories and the distribution of these shows that um, Wakari seem to be splitting in, in a fairly non-consistent way um, so there's a whole range of party sizes that we observe uh, rather than sort of consistently splitting into, into two that have similar numbers each time. This could be showing us that Wakari's are living in multi-level societies so they will split into two and then those two groups will split again into to further subgroups. This supports uh, predictions made by Eckhart Heyman uh, in 1992 but it could also be that uh, Wakari groups are so fluid um, that different parties will break off each time more like you see in the chimpanzees and the tailors, uh, potentially at least. We can also look at the rate of fission fusion behaviour, calling any change in party size either a fission or a fusion. And in 647 hours uh, for which we had good estimates of party size, there were 101 fissions and 127 fusions. Now we should expect those numbers to be similar, and although I can think of a few reasons why we might have more uh, fusions than fissions, uh, if I'm honest the reason is probably because I was more likely to discover wakaris that I had missed in previous counts than I was to lose track of monkeys that I had previously counted. 
For this reason we make our second suggestion that we work with fissions rather than fusions when measuring this aspect of fission-fusion dynamics. The rate of fissioning was 0.16 fissions per hour, which roughly equates to uh, 1.9 fissions per day. And I've done a preliminary analysis on the number of fissions in different habitats at Lago Preto using only the data for which I was able to make good counts of party size in consecutive hours so that I knew exactly which habitat the fission occurred in. So I can tentatively say that there's a significant difference in the rate of fissioning in the different habitats at Lago Preto. So to summarise, my two suggestions are that for species that are too numerous to measure inter-individual distances regularly, to work out cut-off distances for party membership, we could use a distance that reflects separation in terms of feeding composition based on uh, the food cores of the primate. And the second suggestion is that we use fissions rather than fusions as a more reliable measure of the frequency of, of changes in group size. So I'd be very interested to hear if anyone has any thoughts on how we might better use these data. But also this data was collected as part of a broader study and we'll be going out to collect more targeted data uh, next year and it'll be very interesting to see if anyone's got any suggestions on how we could collect some more sophisticated data on fission fusion dynamics for this particular group of wakaris. So please do get in touch via the email on screen if you have any questions or suggestions and thanks for listening.